Yeah, so my name is Carlos Machado. I'm an associate professor here in the Department of Biology at uh, the University of Maryland. I run an evolutionary genetics, evolutionary genomics lab. And we have sort of a lot of really broad interest um, that I could define as trying to understand what are the mechanisms and the forces uh, that either drive divergence at the genetic level between a species, but also the mechanisms and forces involved in the maintenance and generation of genetic variability within species. So basically population genetics and speciation genetics. And we, um, we are kind of eclectic in the sense that we we use different systems, although we focus basically in two systems, uh, Drosophila and Fig wasps and figs. That's our, our, those are our two main systems, but we also do some work on human parasites, trypanosomes, and I'm doing some work right now on wild rice. Uh, we basically address the same type of questions, and we use both empirical um, data, so we collect our own data, mostly uh, genome sequence data or, or sequences of genes, and we also use, um, we also collect data from the transcriptome, so to see which genes are expressed, at what stages, how much they are expressed, when are they turned on and off. And we use those, those data to try to understand, for instance, in the case of Drosophila, uh, we focus on two particular, two species that are sort of classic species for studying a speciation, uh, Drosophila pseudoscura and Drosophila persimilis. Uh, and these species had been studied in the 1930s and 40s. Um, um, but we, we really know very little about their, you know, why they are different, why, uh, what defines them as a species. So why when you cross them in the lab, for instance, you produce hybrids that have fertility problems. So males tend to be um, uh, infertile. Females are fine and they, they are fertile, but, but we cannot really distinguish them at all. They are pretty much identically morphologically in, in almost every sense that we look at. Uh, however, they are different. Um, and they, uh, and so we're trying to address the question of why there are different, why are the differences. And one approach we're taking is to use um, <clears throat> transcriptome data to try to understand, for instance, what genes uh, are expressed at different rates between in the two species. My name is Cather. I am a, an MOCB graduate student who just defended two weeks ago. I'm interested in the evolution of sex-biased gene expression in two groups of Drosophila species that belong to the Pseudobscura group. This is a picture of Drosophila Pseudobscura males. Um, generally, we're interested in um, the phenotypic differences or morphological differences between, between males and females. And these differences are, are interesting because for most species, males and females have identical genomes or near identical genomes, except for the sex chromosomes. So what, what makes it interesting is there's great disparity in their morphology, in their physiology, and in their behavior. And all that occurs as a result of the differential expression of genes uh, between males and females. So genes that are highly expressed in males are male biased, genes that are highly expressed in females are female biased, and then there are classes of genes that are unbiased that are, that are expressed equally in males and females. So we're interested in looking at how gene expression, uh, sex biased gene expression, basically occurs over developmental time. We have a bunch of different um, developmental stages of our two Drosophila species, from early developmental stages to larval stages, a pupil stage and an adult stage. And we look at how sex bias gene expression uh, basically occurs over development. And we find that sex bias gene expression increases as a, as a function of developmental time, so that the most obvious differences um, in in gene expression between the sexes occurs later in development uh, between males and females. And so this is basically uh, my, my main interest in the lab. So I'm interested in the evolution of sex bias gene expression over developmental time. I'm Kevin Nyberg. I'm a graduate student in Dr. Carlos Machado's lab. I, I'm actually very interested in how uh, advances in genome and sequencing technologies can actually help us uh, deepen our understanding of how biology works in an organism. Um, for example, there's a classic assumption, it's called the central dogma, uh, 
of molecular biology in which you, you have uh, DNA which encodes uh, information in a gene and, and that is going to be copied into a messenger RNA which is going to bring information uh, to, to code for a protein and the protein is actually what's going to do all the work in the cell and in the organism. Um, and there was actually a project called the, the ENCODE project a couple years ago. Uh, it started off in humans and then branched out into other organisms, but what it found was out of the entire genome, only a very, very small fraction of the genome actually ended up as a protein. In humans, it was something like one and a half percent, but greater than 80 percent of the entire genome is actually copied into an RNA. So and the question that I'm interested in is what is all of this non-protein coding RNA doing? Now usually when you think of a non-protein coding RNA, you think of these very short molecules that have very conserved structures. But actually most, most of the non-protein coding RNAs uh, in the genome uh, are actually long non-protein coding RNAs, which are, are very similar uh, to messenger RNAs, uh, being hundreds of nucleotides in length. Uh, and we largely don't know uh, what, the, what these RNAs do, uh, how these long non-coding RNAs function, uh, or how these long non-coding RNAs evolve. We don't actually work with humans in the Machado lab, we study fruit flies. Uh, and so what I'm interested in doing is first trying to identify uh, the, the, the total number of long non-coding RNAs uh, in the fruit fly, and then seeing uh, what sort of tissues uh, they happen to be expressed in, and that'll give us some idea of what sort of biological processes they might be involved in. I'm also interested in seeing uh, when in development they're turned on. Are they more likely to, to be turned on in younger or older individuals? And then we're also interested in seeing how they evolve. So, so how does their, their sequence or expression uh, differ in between different species, uh, within populations of the same species, and then also in hybrids between different species? We're also interested in studying the evolution of um, figs and their fig pollinators. These are tiny little wasps that, that are associated with figs. This is a really extraordinary uh, interaction between plants and animals, one that has been around for maybe at least 80, 90, 90 million years and has produced an amazing diversity of species that are mostly found in, in tropical regions around the world. There are maybe about 800 to 1,000 species and of figs, and each one of these figs is associated to a different species of wasp, right? But in many cases, and this is something we discovered several years ago, uh, many figs actually have not just one single wasp that pollinates it, but has multiple species of wasp that pollinates it, uh, up to four in some cases. This is phenomenon of multi multiple pollinators um, is not general, so it doesn't happen uh, in all species of fig, at least based on the data we have, but I think that as people start collecting more and more samples, uh, I think that we'll see that that's probably a more general um, phenomenon. So right now what we, <clears throat> our estimates are maybe about 25% of fig species are, have asso associations with multiple pollinators. We, we're also interested in sort of so we have the two sides of, of the study in which we study patterns of diversion between species, but also patterns of polymorphism within a species and trying to get at the, at the causes of, 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 of the mechanisms that maintain um, genetic variability within species. So, and so we're using fig, fig wasp as a, also a model system to understand um, sort of what are the most important forces um, um, involved in the maintenance of genetic variation within species. And we're using um, uh, transcriptome data, uh, population transcriptome data, to try to address this by looking at um, different species of wasps that differ in the levels of um, inbreeding and see how these levels of inbreeding have an effect on the levels of genomic variability. So it's really, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge project um, that we, I think that we have a lot of um, really interesting consequences for our understanding of the, you know, what are the most important forces driving population genetic patterns or, or shaping patterns of variability in populations.